Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody here today for a conversation on Beyond Afghanistan's Dangerous Summer. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here. I guess Washington is not emptying out in August. Um, and obviously, Afghanistan remains an important issue for all of us to think about and grapple with. I had a chance to go to Afghanistan with uh, Andrew Wilder, our VP for South Central Asia, back in March, where there was this hope and optimism permeating Afghan Afghanistan with the, the relatively new uh, unity government, uh, President Ghani's outreach to Pakistan, uh, the sense that the reform agenda could really take hold. And we hosted President Ghani here at USIP as a part of his um, visit to Washington in, in March. So fast forward to August, July, August, uh, you know, the fighting season came back on with a vengeance and we're all seeing the news of increased presence of Daesh as well as the changes and uh, unexpected news or expected in some cases around Taliban leadership. So we're delighted to have with us here today three very distinguished speakers who will bring us their fresh perceptions, both their experience as well as recent visits to Afghanistan about this inflection point that we're having right now. And, and very fresh, in fact, two of our speakers are off the plane this morning. Um, so we're very happy that we were able to, to, to work that out. Um, today, though, we're particularly honored um, to be able to host uh, Ambassador Dan Feldman, who is our special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Ambassador Feldman has played um, a very pivotal role since the beginning of this administration. So since 2009, he's really been at the heartbeat of supporting um, our engagement with Afghanistan. He's played a particularly important role in supporting uh, the Pakistani-led talks between uh, Kabul and the Taliban. And his experience um, in the region um, has been an important part of his ability to really make a difference on a critical set of issues. Um, he will be joined after he makes remarks by uh, Steve Hadley, who is the USIP board chair, former uh, national security advisor, and a longtime public servant. And that conversation will be moderated by Andrew Wilder, our vice president here at USIP uh, for South Central Asia. And so that, with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Feldman to the stage, who we're very happy to have here uh, to talk with us about your experience and perceptions of the region right now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nancy. I'm really delighted uh, to be here at USIP to give my valedictory address as the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, or as we've termed it, SRAP. Uh, I visited the region this past week uh, to pay my farewell calls and look forward to comparing notes here with uh, Steve and Andrew, given their own extremely recent travels, and really appreciate you uh, having the flexibility to do this on, on this timing. And the relationship with USIP has been a special one, a familial one, uh, a model uh, for the way in which experts and policymakers can shape each other's thinking in a collaborative manner, so thank you for that. I started working, as you alluded, um, on Afghanistan and Pakistan six years ago when Ambassador Richard Holbrook offered me a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity at the inception of the SRAP office to serve as his deputy, and ultimately became special representative myself a year ago. Now that I'm transitioning back to the private sector, I wanted to reflect on the successes that have been achieved while also acknowledging the many challenges that remain. I was incredulous recently when in the midst of testifying to Congress, uh, my deputy was asked derisively, what has diplomacy actually achieved in Afghanistan? And it demonstrated for me the need to highlight the fragile but significant developments in the region that have been fostered and sustained due primarily to the assiduous diplomatic efforts. It was diplomacy that facilitated and nurtured the Afghan, the Afghan effort to create the government of national unity. 
It was diplomacy that has put our bilateral relationship with Pakistan on firmer footing now than at any point in this administration. It was diplomacy that opened an historic opportunity for Afghanistan and Pakistan to work together toward a common interest in peace. It was diplomacy that has supported Afghan determination to fundamentally change the role of women in their society. It was diplomacy that secured the international political and financial support the government and security forces of Afghanistan need. And it can only be through sustained diplomacy with the international community and especially the countries of the region that the opportunity for success in Afghanistan will be preserved. These types of diplomatic openings don't just spontaneously generate. I'm extremely proud to have been a charter member of SRAP, this innovative and entrepreneurial team created by the vision of Secretary Clinton and Ambassador Holbrook and sustained by Secretary Kerry's own commitment to this office, this region, and the power of diplomacy. Due to its achievements, I believe SRAP will serve as a whole of government prototype for how government can more nimbly respond to complex crises in the future. And every day, this dedicated team, many of whom are here today, has honored Richard Holbrook's memory by seeking to fulfill his definition of diplomacy, minimizing conflict, saving lives, and achieving results. You all know the list of momentous achievements in Afghanistan, access to education, improving the role of women and girls, health and longevity, independent media, infrastructure, GDP growth, Afghanistan is simply not the country it was when the Taliban ruled. Political stability in Afghanistan is the linchpin of Afghan security. Just one year ago, the prospects for stable leadership after the electoral impasse seemed remote, and the unpalatable options included an extension of President Karzai's term and threats of a parallel government. After an Afghan request for his intervention, Secretary Kerry made two visits to Kabul last July and August when he famously brokered the political compromise that resulted in the unity government. After achieving agreement on the parameters of that framework, I was left behind in Kabul to lead the mediation and hammer out over the next six and seven weeks a political agreement between now President Ghani and now CEO Abdullah to form a unity government, becoming the first democratic transition of power in Afghanistan's history. Coalition governments, even in the most mature democracies, grapple mightily with implementation, and Afghanistan is no different. But President Ghani's government has made progress in a range of key areas over the past year, from appointments and anti-corruption initiatives to the recent establishment of the Special Electoral Reform Commission, which was especially fulfilling for me to meet with last week. For this unity government to achieve its promises of reform, it must operate in a more inclusive manner. This includes empowering ministries and provincial governors to assume much of the work and engaging more comprehensively with the full range of Afghan stakeholders, the parliament, civil society, opinion leaders, domestic media, and ultimately the Afghan people. Those who feel excluded from the government pave the way for spoilers to attract the disaffected and create unnecessary instability. That is why I urge my colleagues in the Afghan government to seize this last best opportunity to demonstrate that this government is both durable and functional and can translate the rhetoric of policy vision into tangible policy implementation that will benefit the daily lives of all Afghans. And my message to those outside the government is support the unity government and ensure it's on the path to success. This is the legitimate government, reflective of the millions of votes cast that the international community will continue to support. Afghans don't deserve any alternative that weakens rather than strengthens the fabric of their society. Political stability will optimize success in the ongoing efforts to address other related challenges. The economic climate must weather the shock of the drawdown of international resources. And the security challenges, as you alluded to, throughout the country are severe, as the Taliban has launched a violent onslaught, killing many civilians and inflicting significant casualties. We always anticipated that this would be a difficult fighting season and pose a real challenge to the Afghan security forces, but they have held their own. 
While the Taliban has made temporary gains, the ANSF has retaken lost territory, and the Taliban have not seriously challenged any major urban center or provincial capital. The ANSF has proven it was ready for the lead security responsibility transferred to it from NATO last year, and we will continue to support the ANSF as it builds the skills and resources it needs to match its undoubted courage and commitment. One final word on the progress we have seen in Afghanistan. We and our allies should be proud of the role that our assistance has played, including that administered through our unprecedented civilian surge. Development will always be difficult work, and there will at times be accurate reports of waste, given the challenges faced by one of the world's poorest, most conflict-affected, and least institutionalized countries. And to be clear, anyone, American or Afghan, government employee or contractor, who illegally benefits from assistance funds must be held accountable. But despite the easy allure of gotcha reporting on assistance delivery, we must continue to assess the overall impact of our efforts and not just focus on the easiest mechanical accounting of project execution. We must redouble our efforts to provide accountability to the extent feasible, but not fundamentally chill initiatives that are critical to achieving our core security interests, degrading Al Qaeda and its affiliates and ensuring Afghanistan does not once again become a safe haven for terrorists who can threaten international security. These are hard, these are hard goals and important ones, and there will be failures as we try to find the right mix of initiatives to achieve them. But that risk of failure is one worth taking. In Pakistan, too, diplomats have been at the front lines of protecting our national interests. Diplomacy has brought our bilateral relationship from a tumultuous nadir several years ago to its current strengthened and stable position based on a more honest and realistic set of expectations. The principal vehicle for this recovery has been our strategic dialogue, where we have honed in on key themes, key areas of strategic alignment to deliver results, including countering terrorism, addressing nuclear concerns, and prompting stability through economic reforms in trade, energy initiatives, and educational opportunities. This evolving dynamic has produced some notable progress, particularly in targeting Al-Qaeda leadership and countering the threat posed by IEDs. There is a renewed effort by the Pakistani leadership to bring greater security throughout the country, as demonstrated by the ambitious undertaking of the North Wazaristan operation just a year ago, and which has been further accelerated in the aftermath of the Peshawar massacre last December. Our assistance has been of great value under Kerry Luger Berman, which has rebalanced our assistance portfolio in favor of civilian assistance from the previously disproportionate reliance on security assistance. In particular, our ability to better brand key high visibility, high impact signature projects in energy economic growth, infrastructure development, and higher education contributed to improved perceptions of the U.S. High-level economic visits, including by Commerce Secretary Pritzker earlier this year, showcased the potential of the economic relationship, which can be unlocked if Pakistan continues progress on its reform agenda. Yet despite this progress, as with other complex yet crucial relationships, the U.S.-Pakistan one still faces challenges the ones we now discuss in a transparent manner befitting real partners. We continue to have concerns about Pakistan's history of using proxies against perceived foes in the region. Although we've seen concrete actions by Pakistan to more clearly establish the writ of sovereignty, the military and civilian leadership must make good on their commitment not to differentiate between terrorist groups. Just as they have vigorously pursued the Pakistan Taliban, they must take equally forceful actions against groups like Haqqani Network, which pose serious threats to American and Afghan lives and resources, and Lashkar-e-Taiba, which has the potential to destabilize the region. And let me also say a word about Pakistan's democracy. I've heard many allege that the US is ambivalent about democracy in Pakistan, but that could not be further from the truth. We realize that the process of strengthening and embedding democratic rule will be gradual, but it is critical to Pakistan's future. And I know 
This is also understood by both Pakistan's civilian and military leadership. It has been almost eight years since democracy was reinstated in Pakistan, and two and a half years since that country's own first historic transition of power, and there continue to be challenges. Just a year ago, the Sharif government was beset by protests that fed rumors of a coup, but today, it appears that civilian and military leadership have come to an important modus vivendi as preserving the centrality of civilian-led democratic institutions is critical to Pakistan's future. Diplomacy is also giving new life to the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. President Ghani deserves great credit for courageously opening the opportunity for rapprochement with Pakistan, and particularly in such a deliberate and strategic manner. We similarly appreciate Pakistan's efforts to further an Afghan-led, Afghan-owned reconciliation process, as the U.S. has long maintained that it's just such a process which we strongly support without preconditions, which is, surest, which is the surest way to end violence and achieve lasting stability in Afghanistan and the region. It is clear that there can be no long-term stability in Afghanistan without Pakistan's support. And Pakistan has taken unprecedented actions this year to facilitate a discussion between the Afghan government and the Taliban, resulting in the Murray meeting on July 7th, the first time that senior Taliban representatives openly and with permission from their leadership met with an official and representative Afghan government delegation. Needless to say, the news of Mullah Omar's death last week has complicated this picture, but I believe it may be an important opportunity. The Taliban think of themselves as a movement that emerged to end a civil war. Now they have to decide whether to continue to fight or to finally end the violence that has stunted Afghanistan's development and become instead part of the legitimate political system of a sovereign united Afghanistan. Concerted American diplomacy has also resulted in the sustained engagement of the international community and particularly the key nations of the region. Since the beginning of this administration, one important mechanism for coordination has been the International Contact Group, which we launched comprised of the SRAPs from over 50 countries, including more than a third from Muslim-majority countries. And I'm especially optimistic that regional powers have increasingly come to see that supporting a stable Afghanistan, free of terrorism, is in their interests. There has been a marked and productive change in the posture of countries in the region over the past six years. As one particular example, we welcome China's engagement in Afghanistan and Pakistan, which we see not as competitive, but complementary to our own efforts. In 2009, on my first official trip to engage the Chinese, my colleagues in Beijing refused to even have the words Afghanistan or Pakistan on our agenda. Today, we have embarked on a series of collaborative development projects in Afghanistan and convened a trilateral U.S.-China-Afghanistan discussion, both firsts of their kind with the Chinese. Our efforts to spur broader regional integration include both diplomatic endeavors to convene key neighbors, such as through the Heart of Asia process, and economic initiatives, such as energy connectivity between countries via the CASA 1000 project, or fully implementing the promise of the Afghanistan-Pakistan Transit Trade Agreement. Our interest in stability in Afghanistan and, pa and Pakistan is no less acute than it was 14 years ago. The achievements that have been made in Afghanistan and Pakistan have come at the cost of an immense investment in blood and treasure by not just the US, but by our coalition partners, and most of all, by Afghans and Pakistanis. Those investments can be redeemed and our interests secured only by continued diplomacy. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to learn from some of America's finest and most storied diplomats and to myself carry that baton for a year, working with what remains, as Ambassador Holbrook frequently touted, the best and most dedicated team that I've ever seen. And I will watch with passionate interest as they continue this critical work. Thank you.
guest of honor. Good. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Feldman. Thank all of you. It is indeed encouraging, as Nancy <coughs> noted, to see so much interest in Afghanistan with all the other crises brewing. Sometimes we do worry that Afghanistan will be forgotten, but today it doesn't look like it is. Um, with that, though, we'll turn it over to Mr. Steve Hadley, the chairman of our board. And as Nancy noted, we just got off the plane this morning from a fairly grueling 10 days of travel. Uh, we had about two and a half days in Pakistan. Then we're in Kabul for four and a half days and ended with three days in India. And on the flight back, Steve noted to me that this was, I think, the longest business trip, work-related trip he had ever taken. So, uh, but with that, over to you, Steve. Well, it was a great trip. And I'll just talk a little bit, really elaborating a little bit more detail on what Dan talked about. We'll talk a little bit here, and then we'll go out to questions. I was surprised, uh, I was last in the region three years ago, and I was surprised how dramatically uh, things have changed. Uh, of course, one of the ones, one of the things that Dan talked about was the transition, the political and security transition um, that occurred in 2014. And if you had talked to any of us in 2011 and said, how is that going to work out? I think we would have been very skeptical, and I think we're delighted the way it has worked out. There is a new unity government uh, in power uh, in Kabul. Uh, the security forces are taking responsibility for the whole country. They are taking casualties, but they are, uh, they are holding their own. Um, and that is the good news. Um, they are under pressure. Uh, you know, unity governments are not designed for efficiency and effectiveness many times. And uh, it shows in this government delays in uh, appointments, um, reforms moving not as quickly as people have, would have liked. And there's some loss of patience. And one of the things that I think Dan, uh, em the ambassador, emphasized in his remarks is, and I think the government knows that it, it is time for it to step up and perform. And it needs to show some progress on the economy. The withdrawal of international assistance really caused an enormous economic crisis. They need to get on with it, be able to show their some people some their people some success. They need strategic communications. They need to be explaining to their people, to the region, and to Americans what they're doing. There is a good story, but you wouldn't know it if you read it uh, in the newspapers. Um, second of all. The security forces have a greater challenge than I anticipated. One of the things that uh, I didn't fully realize was that when the Pakistanis finally decided to move into North Waziristan, uh, which is something we wanted them to do in 2011, 2012, they did it in 2014, pushing a lot of extremists and terrorists into Afghanistan right at the point of the security transition from coalition forces to Afghan forces, the time when the Afghans were least able to deal with that problem. And why is there now suddenly violence in the north? It's because a lot of those extremists went north and took an area that had been quite calm and turned it into a battleground. Secondly, if you talk to Afghans, they will tell you that at the same time Pakistan decided to engage in a reconciliation process, Afghans believe they also doubled down on this fighting season, both as a hedge against the failure of the reconciliation and, quite frankly, the way countries do to strengthen their hands and the Taliban's hands for the negotiations. So the government faces uh, real challenges. That said, there is an opportunity. Um, uh, President Ghani reached out to Pakistan in a way that caused, I think, a fair amount of criticism in Afghanistan. But he said to the Pakistanis that he was prepared to take their interests into account, he was prepared to take steps against the Pakistani Taliban that are in Afghanistan posing a problem in, to Pakistan, if they would take the lead and step up, produce the Taliban at the table, and start a reconciliation process. And our sense from the Pakistanis we talked to is they believe that uh, President Ghani is genuine in what he says, that he wants a new relationship. Pakistanis also have some reasons to look at reconciliation this time. 
Uh, in December of last year, uh, the terrible attack in Peshawar, which killed over 100 uh, young people at a military institution, training educational institution, really was a wake-up call of the problem that the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP, the threat they posed to Pakistan. And I think Pakistan is beginning to understand that Pakistan needs a stable Afghanistan if Pakistan is going to deal with its own terrorist problems. Uh, and I think that has begun to, to uh, take a, uh, have an impact on Pakistani uh, views and resulted in these, uh, these talks. I think the Taliban also may be deciding that time is not on their side. Um, the Afghan security forces did not collapse at the transition, as many people thought. They are stressed, but they are holding. Um, the appearance of the Islamic State is a problem for the Taliban because it uh, could wean away some supporters. And the pressure, I think, that the F Pakistanis are putting on them are real. And the other thing is this after-the-fact two-year belated announcement that Mullah Omar is dead raised a lot of questions in the minds, not just of Afghans, but maybe of Taliban's, of who were they fighting for for the last two years? Who was issuing the orders? And the fact that Pakistan is no, now so upfront in terms of the reconciliation process raises a question of, are Taliban just an agent for Pakistan? And that does not bode well if you're recruiting among Afghans. So the Taliban have some reason to enter in this reconciliation process. Now, um, it's certainly uncertain as to where things head from here. One interpretation is that the discord that has resulted from the announcement of the death of Malomar is in fact Taliban leadership and the Pakistanis taking some skeletons out of the closet and setting the table for negotiations. Let's hope that is the case. There's also a good chance that the movement might split and that some elements of that movement may come under the black flag of the Islamic State. Uh, so a lot of uncertainty as to where this is, goes, but despite a lot of skepticism we heard in Afghanistan, most Afghans say this reconciliation effort is worth pursuing and I, I very much uh, think that it is. Um, there is another, I think, thing we have to focus on, and that is uh, diplomacy has done all the things that Dan has described. But it is also the case that diplomacy has been backed up by security efforts by the Afghan security forces and the United States. And it is um, military pressure that has in part brought the Taliban to the table and the Taliban are themselves using military force to enhance their negotiating. So I would echo Dan's point. We are at a moment when there is actually the possibility of reconciliation and peace in Afghanistan. And we should give that effort our full diplomatic support. We should be putting pressure on the Pakistanis not only to produce Taliban at the table, but to produce an agreement. And we should rally the international community to put pressure on as well. But also, this would be a, a devastating time. And secondly, we need to support, of course, the government. Politically, we need to help them get their economic situation going so that they can give some people some hope. But it also would be a terrible time for us to withdraw or suggest that we are withdrawing support for the Afghan security forces now that they are under pressure. So one of the things that we, the United States, can do to advance the cause of peace is support the effort, the, the Afghan government diplomatically, pressure the Taliban, help them on the economic problems, but also make clear that we are going to continue our support for the Afghan security forces, that we are going to continue the training program and the advise and assist program that currently goes on, maybe even expanding it because of the increased military threat that the Afghan security forces face. A threat that we did not really understand when we designed the transition in 2014 and did not fully appreciate when a decision was made to get all of our troops down to a level of 1,000 at the end of 2016. 
I think we think that issue and that decision needs to be reconsidered because, as President Ghani would say, he, Afghanistan is now fighting terrorists from Central Asia, from Caucasus, uh, from the Middle East, uh, and now with the appearance of Daesh. And it needs our support. And we really need to have a counterterrorism capability in Afghanistan with Afghan forces to deal with those terrorist forces and keep them at bay so that we have the opportunity for negotiating a peace for Taliban and so that those terrorist groups do not do their, do not threaten uh, Afghan, Afghans, countries in the region, the United States. So there is hope out there. There is an opportunity for peace. It's going to require the Afghans to do the things Dan talked about, but it's also going to uh, require us to do some things to show a commitment to this process, a commitment that's got to last beyond 2016. And if we do not do that, I have no doubt that it will probably doom this opportunity for peace we have in front of us now. It's a fascinating place. Uh, Afghans are courageous people and they deserve our support. Andrew? Thank you, Steve. Um, earlier today, I was reading a news report um, about uh, the Taliban down in Quetta forming a, trying to form a unity shura. And I actually thought there's no one better than Ambassador Feldman to go down to Quetta and try to work on forming this unity shura to work with the unity government in Kabul. So that could be your next job. But, um, but I have to say, I think many of you in the room I, uh, were joined us for a public session we had in mid-June, just after I returned from, uh, Scott Smith and I returned from a trip to Afghanistan then. And along with Ali Jalali and Bill Byrd, I think we proceeded to depress everyone in the room with a fairly gloomy picture about the security situation, which was not going well in terms of casualty rates. Um, uh, and today also a terrible report on the increase in civilian casualty rates. Uh, the economic situation is very grim, and I might just say a word about that in a minute. Um, um, and on the political front, the little cause for optimism that things are going to move forward. Um, many of those conditions, unfortunately, still remain the same. Those are still very real challenges. Um, I think someone on our visit said, it's like we have to flip a coin and all three times it has to turn up heads to make this work. But, um, but this trip, I have to say, I did come back more encouraged and precisely because of there's a much, the prospects for this peace process getting on track are much greater than they were in June when we visited. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty now with the announcement of Mullah Omar's death. There's lots of grounds for skepticism. It's very likely things might not work out. But I do think it's important not to be so skeptical about the prospects for peace that we miss the opportunity when it presents itself. And I think right now is a time that both for the uh, Afghans and the Afghan Taliban, as well as Pakistan and the U.S. and our allies, is an opportunity that we must seize. So I do think it's a inter really interesting time in that regard. Um, I did want to say a little bit um, on the economic piece, which I think we haven't focused on so much, because I do, I am personally concerned that that might be one of the single biggest challenge um, to, the, to the current unity government. I mean, on one hand, you know, clearly, they have got to get their act together and start performing and move from process to actually producing. Um, and, you know, there has been progress. There has been a, quite a few of the appointments. The cabinet is pretty much full, except for the acting uh, minister of defense. Two-thirds of the governor appointments have taken place, but there's still um, lots more that needs to be done on that front. Um, but in the economic situation, I think that's largely a situation right now beyond the control, certainly in the short term, of the government. And that's something I think at one level we all intellectually knew, that once the war and aid economy sort of bubble was popped, it would be very painful. Um, but I think that you, you just see every, every meeting we had, it, we heard accounts of this, and including the last day we met with our our fabulous uh, USIP team in Kabul, and Steve went around the room asking people about their thoughts, and many pointed to the economic situation, as well as that many people are now looking for exit strategies. Um, and so I would actually ask, think that the international community in the US should be giving uh, consideration for some type 
a short-term stimulus package of some sort so that it's not the collapsing economy that brings the government down. I mean, they have their own problems that might bring themselves down, but we shouldn't let it be the economic uh, crisis. That in the short term, some job creation schemes, uh, there are some other, even there's an interesting innovative idea for uh, an urban national solidarity program type program to help stimulate the economy, some land registration program. So there's some ideas that the government is working up, which I think do deserve consideration to try to buy some political space for the national unity government to actually figure out how to govern, but also time for the peace process to, to mature. Um, so that's one thing I would highlight. And at the same time, of course, they do need to take the, the, you know, the tough reform measures that, that can lead to change in the medium to long term. But I do think that that's the other thing I would point to is progress, which there is a very deep this is a reform-oriented government, unlike what we had in the past. And it would be a shame to be sort of backing away from supporting a government that finally has the political will and wants to actually push a reform agenda forward. And certainly in our programs at USIP, we're already noticing a big difference, where we actually now find we are actually moving some of our strategy from working mostly in the informal sp space with civil society organizations to consciously now finding reformers in government to partner with government to implement some of our programs. And we're, we're finding a, a dramatic change from a year or two ago uh, in, in that regard. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think I'll ask um, Ambassador Feldman and Steve a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, but I think maybe I'll start with you, Dan, in sure. terms of one of the things we heard very, very contradictory messages on in the region was Daesh. Um, from most of the government actors we spoke to uh, felt that it was a problem uh, and, and a point of concern and often, but also a pressure point on the Taliban. Many of the analysts we spoke to did not think it was a big, as big a concern, that the Salafi ideology does not is not attractive to most Afghans. Someone said how for 25 years the Saudis have been trying to create a Salafi regime in Kunar and have not succeeded. Um, uh, so, but very contradictory uh, analyses of the threat that Daesh poses. And so I was wondering if you might want to comment a bit on that. Sure. Um, we're, we're keeping a very close eye on, on, on Daesh. I mean, we are just still in the process of collecting as much accurate information as possible, assessing it, and then trying to uh, determine how it may influence uh, our footprint, our decision making, uh, what we have to continue to do on, on counterterrorism effort. It's, it's clearly uh, a concern and has been a growing concern, given the fact that none of us were talking about Daesh a year ago, certainly not in this region. Um, there have been some um, uh, notable leadership losses of, of Daesh uh, recently, but in terms of the uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, but uh, but given the fact that uh, it's uh, the, the the battles have, have been between Taliban and Daesh, unclear whether it's just disaffected Taliban or looking to recruit others, if it's opportunistic or is attracting, that's the type of thing that we don't have as much of a sense or what sort of threat mm -hmm. it would pose to the Afghan state or to uh, the international community down the road. But. I think to, to Steve's point, I mean, given that I'm still in government for a few more days, I, I won't step on decisions that, uh, that our president is still going to be making over the coming weeks and months about uh, our footprint. But clearly, we have taken uh, a number of opportunities to demonstrate that there is flexibility in terms of how we are operationalizing, whether that was with the extension of authorities at the end of last year, or whether it was with the bridging uh, period uh, earlier this year uh, in the transition to the Resolute Support Mission until the rest of the international partners could get there, or most recently when President Ghani was here in March and asked for us to keep our full complement of forces uh, in Afghanistan, at least through the end of the fighting season, which the President agreed to. And so as the circumstances continue to be assessed and evaluated and what needs to be done on counterterrorism um, more globally and how Afghanistan and Pakistan fit into that uh, global approach, uh, we will see what sorts of decisions will, will continue to be made. I, I would note in terms of the allure in the region, it's certainly just as much of a concern in Pakistan, and the Pakistan leadership is very, very acutely focused on the potential growth of, of Daesh. 
Uh, and so, yet again, I think this is an alignment of interest between the Afghans and the Pakistanis, and one that I hope that they can move forward on in, in terms of uh, collaborating and determining uh, at least a uh, coordinated response, if not, a, if not a joint response. And this ultimately goes as well to the reconciliation issues in a range of, uh, of, of uh, other potential opportunities that, that you noted. Because there really can be no long-term sustainability uh, or stability in Afghanistan without Pakistan, the more that can be done uh, to bridge Afghanistan and Pakistan, whether that's on the economic side, the trade side, uh, the people-to-people -people, uh, contacts on uh, cross-border military issues, on military training, on uh, intelligence, uh, and certainly on something like Daesh, which crosses across those, the more trust that can be built and the more we've helped to uh, nurture a facilitative environment that when the time is ripe for a reconciliation discussion that it can best support that. Good. Steve, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just want to say one thing. If, if the president decides, as I hope he would do, to leave a fairly robust presence there in order to advance the cause of the peace process that would involve um, continuing support for the Afghan military, um, support for the, the training assist mission, and a robust seat counterterrorism presence. And maybe that, you know, totals up to 5,000 or 6,000 people. There will be a lot of people, and a lot of them will be Republicans, who will say, see, we told you, you were wrong to say you were going to come down to 1,000 troops at the end of the 2016. You were wrong. We were right. And I would hope that that reaction, predictable though that it may be in Washington today, given the politicization, will not stop the president, because that's not how I would be saying to the president. I would say to the president, you had a series of, of policies, Mr. President. You made a lot of tough decisions, and those tough decisions have worked. You got a political transition. You got a security transition. You gave this government a chance. But the situation has changed. The Middle East has melted down. The state system is in collapse, and it has given a boost to existing terror groups like Al-Qaeda and spawned a new one called the Islamic State. Um, and the situation in Afghanistan, for a lot of reasons I described, is very different. So, Mr. President, you need to be flexible to adapt our policy to the new situation, the negative things that have happened, but also capitalize on the opportunity for reconciliation. That's how I hope the president will see it. This is not a result. The need to relook at this is not a result, actually, of the failure of his policy. It's a result of the success of his policy. And I hope he is willing to do that because I, one of the other things it will do is it, it will uh, enhance the chances for peace. And it will also mean that his successor, whoever that he or she may be in January of 2017, will not be faced with a crisis in Afghanistan when they walk in the, in the office, Oval Office door. I wanted a, a follow-up question for you. Uh, we ended our trip in India. Um, and of course, the whole Indo-Pak conflict plays quite a big role in terms of the problems in Afghanistan as well. And I was sort of wondering if you wanted to reflect a bit on what we were hearing in Delhi with regards to the situation in Afghanistan. It, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief. One of the things that I didn't realize till we went to India and, and heard, and it's a good advertisement that when you go to the region, you've got to go to all three countries or you won't see the whole story. <laughs> One of the other problems and delicate challenges for President Ghani is on the one hand he has to send the message to the Pakistanis that Afghanistan is not going to be hostile to Pakistan and is not going to be a satellite of India, which was the suspicion that Pakistan had of President Karzai. But on the other hand, at the same time, he's got to send a message to India that Afghanistan is not going to outsource its foreign policy to Pakistan, and is not going to be under a satellite of Pakistan either. He's going to have to exquisitely balance that relationship because he needs both countries. He needs Pakistan to help him deal with his Taliban problem, and he needs India to help him deal particularly with his economic problem. So, you know, there are few presidents in the world today that have the set of challenges in front of them. 
that Af Ashraf Ghani does, and uh, he's. Uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet against him. I know this is the question you don't want to get, but um, <laughs> the Mullah Omar question. But in particular, I think beyond that, of course, there's lots of daily. It's a moving you know, story in terms of how that how that's going to unfold and what impact it's going to have on the peace process. But maybe taking a step back and just going into a little bit more detail in terms of why do you think we actually got to this point at this right right now in terms of the peace process um, that we you know we didn't have much movement for a long time. Um, and also maybe speak a little bit more about the role of regional actors in China in particular in terms of helping to get this uh, on track. And then, of course, we want to hear when Murray II will be. So. Um, with regard to Mullah Omar, it's not that I don't want to answer. The, the honest fact is that everything at this point is just too speculative. We just, we just don't know enough. We are waiting to see what emerges. Um, and the one thing I'd say is that I think it's probably too facile much of what you, what you see in the, pre, in the press, that there are certain factions that are pro-peace or anti-peace, certain factions that are, are, have long relationships with ISI versus those that don't, certain factions um, that, uh, that may just be involved in a quest for leadership power. Uh, clearly, the Taliban has their own interagency uh, disagreements, um, and uh, we're seeing how that plays out, and much as it may be uh, tempting, I think I was the, the only person that was involved both in the recount here in the U.S. and the, uh, and the unity government efforts in Afghanistan. I will not take the hat trick of, uh, of trying to insert myself into the Taliban process as well, um, but, it, but it would be fascinating. Um, so, we just don't, so we just don't see. Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't know enough to, to actually offer that assessment, um, but, we, but we will see what happens. Um, and uh, I returned a few days before you, on, on Sunday, and the last uh, official I saw um, was in Pakistan in terms of the, the military leadership. And they expressed every commitment, as did the civilian uh, leadership when I had met them a few days before, that, uh, that they would continue to try to get this on track uh, as soon as possible. They hoped that it was just a temporary postponement. Clearly, a lot depends on uh, what emerges from the Taliban leadership, um, but that they remain absolutely uh, committed uh, to continuing to try to facilitate this track, which is something we're very strongly supportive of. In terms of what's changed, I think um, there's a change in, in leadership in both countries, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there's a change in personalities. Uh, but most importantly, I think uh, Pakistan recognized uh, two things. One, I, I remember visiting with uh, Secretary Clinton a few years ago, where she warned publicly and, and privately gave the story of those who uh, raise snakes in their backyard are, are going to be bitten. And I think particularly post Peshawar, that was really internalized. They talk about that constantly as their 9-11. And the fact that there is a common nexus, a, a communal cauldron of extremism, um, and whether it's TTP or whether it also uh, gives rise to Afghan Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Haqqani Network or ETIM or the range of other actors that other countries are also involved in, uh, is a compelling one, and one that's uh, increasingly clear that there are these connections there. And so there has been a redoubling of efforts domestically to take on extremism and recognizing um, that, uh, that, that reconciliation, the reconciliation process is part of that. I think the other piece is that looking at, um, as we got closer to uh, the, the security transition, um, the fact that the international community is at 10% of the international forces that were there two, three years ago, 10 to 15,000 as opposed to about 150,000. Uh, they recognized that they weren't benefiting from, the, from the, the potential of insecurity and instability on their borders. Um, that they had to be invested in stability, which, as I noted, is fundamentally political stability. Um, so the success of this unity government, their ability to confront militarily the Taliban, but that ultimately a reconciliation process was the surest way to, to uh, that resolution. So, uh, so we have seen, I think, a, a pretty, quite significant movement here from the, Taliban, from the uh, Pakistani government with regard to the Taliban, including um, uh, the commitments by Prime Minister Sharif, General Sharif, when they visited Kabul uh, a few months ago, and their continuing effort to get this process on track. In terms of the, the other members of the region, we have always said and been 
long uh, consistent that we support any sort of reconciliation uh, process that's Afghan-led, that's Afghan-owned, um, without preconditions, but with end results uh, of the same three red lines that the Taliban break with al-Qaeda, that they renounce uh, international terrorism and violence, and that they embrace the Afghan constitution, and including its rights of, for, for women. Um, given that it's Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, if the Afghan government uh, wants us to play some role in that, including uh, as we did in the first Murray talks as, uh, as an observer, not a participant, uh, then we're happy to do so and we'll continue to do what they ask us to do to help facilitate this. Um, and similarly, if they think that there are other key actors, including the Chinese in this instance, who could also be helpful in that process, then we also welcome that. Um, but this is uh, their call, this is uh, their process, and it's gotta be between the Afghan government and the Afghan Taliban about the future of Afghanistan. Yeah, I was just going to say one, one comment. Um, one of the senior Afghan officials we talked to did mention how um, the TTP has changed things also significantly, that uh, the more the Afghan state gets destabilized by these kind of actors, the more safe havens in Afghanistan there will be for the TTP to destabilize Pakistan. And so a growing recognition of that concern was also mentioned. Uh, but Steve? Yeah. I just uh, neglected to mention two other things we heard in India that were relevant. Yeah. One is the Indians feel that how this reconciliation comes out affects them. How much influence the Taliban government has in, in, in Afghanistan post-reconciliation. How much influence Pakistan continues to exert on Taliban. So one of the things we heard was uh, the U.S. government needs to be in dialogue with India about how this reconciliation is going and taking into account some of India's concerns. Uh, and the second thing we heard is a concern that the Pakistan may feel or believe that if in some sense they accommodate us by encouraging the Afghans and the Taliban to reconcile, that will effectively raise the threshold of allowable cross-border activity by terrorists from Pakistan into India, something the Indians would not take kindly to. So I just to emphasize the point, we need to make the point to Pakistan, uh, and, and I think the regional neighbors need to make the point, where A, we support reconciliation, and B, any terrorism in the region is unacceptable. There aren't good terrorists and bad terrorists. It's all got to stop. And uh, that was the second message we heard from India. <clears throat> and I think we got the, impre the impression that it was a, a Pakistan-controlled, Afghan-led peace process. But, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but, and, and, and both points that we are frequently engaged on, we uh, try to be as transparent and frequent in our consultations with key governments as possible, in addition to obviously working very closely with uh, SCA and Assistant Secretary Biswal. I've gone to India several times a year, for years at this point, Thanks including most recently um, in, in May, I think, when I saw not only Ambassador Jay Shankar, but National Security Advisor. Uh, and we try to ensure that they have uh, every bit of a sense of what's going on as we do. Clearly, um, they express their great skepticism about it, but right. I think the more uh, that we can demonstrate uh, what we believe is occurring, what we believe is uh, incentivizing it, and how we think it's uh, productive ultimately for the long-term stability of the region, the better, and that this isn't a zero-sum game. It isn't um, uh, favoring Pakistan versus uh, India or vice versa. Uh, and clearly the message on no terrorism of any kind across any borders is one that we uh, also make extremely clear to uh, in, in, in all of our bilateral meetings, as I'm sure, I'm not as I'm sure you know. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I have one more question for Steve, then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Um, Steve, I was wondering if you would comment how, what what you would say to the American people, you know, given the fact that we um, have some estimates spent a trillion dollars in Afghanistan in the last 13 years, and over 2,300 lives of our servicemen and women kill, killed in Afghanistan, um, to make the case for why the U.S. needs to remain engaged, both militarily and politically and economically, uh, for the longer term? I would say, I think actually Dan made it very well in his speech, and so I'll just 
uh, echo it briefly. One, it has been an, a, major, uh, a major commitment by the men and women of the United States, our taxpayers, our men and women in uniform, coalition supporters, and the Afghan people. Two, it has accomplished a lot. Afghanistan is a different place. Three, there is an opportunity after all the time and effort, after the mistakes that were made by uh, all of us, Afghans, Bush administration, Obama administration, there is a chance that this com can come out well for the Afghan people and for stability in the region. It's not a sure thing, but there is a chance. And with what is, in comparison to the investment we've made in the past, a modest investment, we can enhance the chances for that outcome. And it matters because a destabilization in this part of the region, a South Asia and a Middle East that is a constant cauldron of violence, is an incubator for terrorist groups, and terrorist groups, in the end of the day, come for the United States. So it is in our humanitarian interest, it's also in our national security interests. And I, I think if the President of the United States explains it to the American people, the American people have good sense, and they will do it. And it's not talking about resuming combat operations. It's not talking about uh, large numbers of American troops. It's not a return to casualties among young men and women. It is enabling the Afghans to take and seize control of their own future and maybe find a path to peace and reconciliation. And that is an opportunity well worth taking. Thanks, okay, uh, open to audience questions. Um, I think if you, are we, you know, someone will deliver a mic right, right, right in the back. The back row there, there is a question. Je Um, I could ask, please keep your questions short so that we have a time for as many as possible. Uh, and thank we'll, you. We'll shorten our answers. At least I'll shorten my answers. <laughs> so happily, we'll get more questions. Uh, Hello, Osmani. Uh, visiting a scholar with John Hopkins Eyes. Uh, talking of the challenges, uh, of course, the good news and other achievements, but talking of the challenges given the internal politics side, uh, you, all of you, visited uh, Kabul and you met uh, different political groups. Uh, looking at the internal politics, there are some concerns about the ITAM without the unity government's agreement with regards to change of constitutions to have CEO's job as a permanent uh, thing in the constitutions. Did you really see that as a concern, how you look at it? Uh, because that should come after the second year of the government to look at. Just one more small uh, thing is about the election commission. Ambassador Feldman, I think you visited a member of election commission personally. Did you have a specific recommendation to them and what's the US expectation from that commission? Let's take two or three questions and we'll come back. Um, right here in the middle. That's one for you. <laughs> If you please identify yourself as well, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Vasilis, a, re a research fellow at Tsinghua University, Beijing. I had the pleasure and honor of listening to uh, Stephen Hadley the last two years, many times. He came to China, and I guess you tried to persuade the Chinese to have a, a constructive participation in Afghanistan. So based on your experience, what is the Chinese position in Afghanistan right now? And the second part of the question, China has unleashed a mega project, the uh, One Road, One Belt, One Road, the new Silk Road project, but the U.S. had stayed outside by your own initiative. So China is trying to invest, to build advanced material conditions, but the U.S. is scared. Maybe you don't know why China is doing that. You're staying outside. And I'm wondering, if you're staying outside, then how exactly could the two countries build a, har a harmonious transition in that uh, turbulent area? Thank you. Okay, and the one over here, Mark Schneider. Uh, Mark Schneider, International Crisis Group. Uh, thank you all. Um, and I, I'm, I must admit that the, there is a degree of optimism that comes through uh, your comments, uh, and I hope you're right. Um, there are some concerns. Yesterday, General Campbell um, made some comments in which he also talked about the, how the ANSF is stretched thin. And uh, given the levels of attacks that they've had this year, which really is the highest level since 2001, and um, in that regard, 
uh, I guess I have two questions. One is, unless the Taliban believe that they cannot attain their objectives militarily, it doesn't seem to me that reconciliation is going to go very far. And so the question is whether you can reach that position without a firm commitment, as Steve said, that the U.S. is going to maintain those combat enablers well beyond 2016. And the second is whether Pakistan, which it still has not done, is going to put the kind of pressure on the rear guard of the Taliban, particularly the Qani network, that makes it clear that they will not be able to maintain the level of military uh, attacks that they have thus far. Good, thanks. Dan, do you want to tackle a couple of those? Sure. And, and um, uh, on the first question on, on uh, the Constitution or whatever may need to be done constitutionally in Afghanistan, th this is for the Afghans to, to work out. It's their constitution. It's, uh, it's, it's, they will be the ones who will need to figure out how to uh, implement the political agreement uh, which they agreed to, uh, part of which was uh, a call for a constitutional lawyer, Jirga, uh, to determine what the constitutional structure is in terms of the division of power between a president and potentially uh, an executive prime minister down the road. But these are, this is, these are Afghan laws, Afghan interpretation, um, and certainly the Afghans have demonstrated over many years that they have the ability uh, to, uh, to, to figure out uh, within their legal systems how to uh, ensure that there is um, a credible uh, uh, government in, in place, and so uh, we look to see how they will ultimately uh, fulfill this uh, on, on, on that score. With regard to the Electoral Reform Commission, I was there uh, only to meet with them because I was uh, I'm, uh, very devoted to um, their, the mandate that they have uh, and the importance of electoral reform, uh, certainly something that Secretary Kerry felt, feels passionately about. Uh, having uh, been there for the disputed elections in 2009, again in 2014, um, and speaking very personally when he uh, was engaging with, uh, with both President Ghani, with at the time uh, Dr. Ghani, Dr. Abdullah, about his own experiences as a politician, the importance um, and the real touchstone that free and fair and transparent elections have to the heart uh, to, to, in, in any well-functioning democracy. Um, and so ensuring that future elections uh, will be as fair and credible as possible is, is critically important, um, both uh, for the international community, which is, as they continue to support elections, uh, wants to ensure that they're credible, but most importantly for Afghans uh, in terms of the votes that they're casting. So um, I just wanted to hear from them uh, how they were starting to implement their, their mandate, which, I, which was an extremely kind of compelling presentation, very comprehensive about what they hope to do. Um, with regard to the Chinese, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we've seen a real uh, progression from them over the course uh, of the last six years. I'd say the, the trajectory of any of the key partners, it has uh, changed uh, the most significantly and the most positively in my mind in terms of their willingness uh, to engage. So uh, the fact that uh, President Ghani made his first official trip to China, that China hosted the Heart of Asia conference last year about the future uh, of Afghanistan, that they uh, want to play a role in reconciliation, that their uh, assistance uh, commitments are uh, much needed in Afghanistan on core development projects, um, and a range of other initiatives. Clearly, uh, there's, uh, there's a degree of, of self-interest given uh, the stability on their, on, on their border as a, as, a, as a neighbor for economic investments, concerns on counterterrorism. Um, but whatever is, has, has increased their desire to be engaged, it's something that, um, that we greatly welcome. I think the idea of the one belt, one ro road, and whether or not the U.S. is part of it is, is, um, uh, is misunderstood. Uh, we were involved in a new Silk Road initiative uh, over the past few years. There's many, many complementary parts uh, to what the Chinese initiative is. Uh, we see these as uh, basically uh, efforts to pursue the same end goals. Um, we may not be involved in exactly similar projects. In fact, in Pakistan, uh, when President Xi visited recently, he announced billions of dollars of assistance, uh, much of it in energy, and which we saw as extremely complementary to our own Kerry Luger Berman. We are not uh, investing for a variety of reasons in coal fired projects and civil nuclear uh, uh, 
uh, efforts. Um, but if they're able to do that, and if it's complementary to our efforts to invest in hydro and renewables, um, the, the goal is to get as many megawatts on the grid and benefit uh, the Pakistani people and help to contribute to Pakistani stability. And we, we welcome um, the Chinese efforts there. Um, uh, with regard to, uh, to, to Mark's question, um, I think that uh, um, you know we will have to just continue to evaluate the security situation. I mean, we, we, when I was there, I spent quite a bit of time with General Campbell. He's uh, here now for consultations. We feel um, can very well served uh, by uh, uh, by his advice and counsel. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, incentivizing the Taliban. You know, I, I think that everyone has thought about this as uh, parallel courses for quite a while, that there would be fighting and likely, hopefully, talking uh, at the same time. Um, again, I can't speak for the Taliban, but were they to come um, to the end of the fighting season and it was still a relative impasse, as it has been for many years, except this time the impasse is with ANSF lead, uh, with a new uh, uh, fragile government, but which is gradually strengthening, um, would that be more of an incentive for them to join at that point, as opposed to seeing what years and years more uh, could uh, could unfold? Perhaps, but uh, but we'll see what incentivizes them. And on the Pakistani side, um, as I as I noted in my remarks, they've done um, they've done quite a bit in terms of pressuring uh, a Taliban and helping to facilitate uh, the, the these first nascent efforts at a reconciliation process. We'll see what continues uh, to occur um, in that. Uh, in that specific channel, but clearly a core part of this for us and the Afghans will be uh, continued and increased pressure uh, on the Haqqani networks and others. I think Dan's answered the question. I'll just make two footnotes. Um, President Ghani was very interesting. We had lunch with him and then uh, a short meeting and he said, you know, he said, Afghanistan is fighting terrorists from Central Asia, the Middle East, and the Caucasus. We're fighting global terror on behalf of the global community, and we're not getting much help. <laughs> and there's some, uh, I think, truth to that. And I think that explains why China is now decide it has an interest in trying to help Afghanistan stabilize it, because some of those terrorists in Afghanistan are coming for China. And I think China realizes that. And the only other thing I would say is I, I would agree with you that um, uh, in order for the Taliban not to think that they can wait this out, the time is on their side and they can militarily get what they want, um, the Afghan military needs to continue to stay in the game. And that's going to require enablers from the United States and it's going to require, I believe, a presence much greater than what was contemplated for by the end of the 2016. And, and it is the irony of peacemaking in this context, I was thinking about it, that at this moment where we think we have the opportunity for peace, both the prospects for peace and the pace of the fighting have both gone up. And that's because our adversaries here are both, ta are both talking but also fighting as a hedge, but also to engage leverage in the negotiations. It's just, it's, it's the way these things sometimes work. Um, and uh, we need to act in that context so we don't lose this opportunity for peace. I would just add to that, though. I also don't think it's like the Taliban are, I think, um, are not you know, under pressure themselves. Um, I think the focus is on the number of ANDSF casualties. I think there's been lots of Taliban casualties as well, right. plus this added complication of the leadership uh, struggles, plus I think genuine more pressure from Pakistan on them. And so I don't think that they um, you know, are not under pressure themselves and it's, and it's just about fighting. I think it's also interesting, back to a point we were discussing about earlier, is um, most of the various factions we're seeing in the last week or two emerge, um, most of them I think are, have been supportive of the peace process their issue is whether it's a peace process controlled by Pakistan or one that takes place outside of Pakistan. And that's been one of the causes of disputes. I mean, I think this is, still has a lot, long ways to play out. But, right. um, but I think it's been encouraging, I think, to see that many of these uh, 
uh, leaders have, have come out publicly in support of the peace process. Um, and just one other thing on the China, the One Belt, One Road, or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, I would mention, because I've also been involved in a U.S.-China, so track 1.5 at times, track 2 dialogue on Afghanistan and Pakistan, and this has been an important theme of it. But one of the things I would like to see China do, now that they've gotten interested in peace between with the Taliban in Afghanistan, is also get more interested in AFPAC peace. Because I think for China, sorry, Indo-PAC peace, um, um, they of course have their own disputes with India, um, but they also have major, major economic interests in seeing, I think, South Asia become more economically integrated and become more vibrant and a market for their goods, but also for cheap labor, for production. For, uh, so I think a $46 billion investment in Pakistan, to me, does not make too much economic sense in a north-south China-Pakistan economic corridor, unless it's somehow linked to an east-west one, which is, I think, where you see a lot more economic potential. And so um, I think this is one of the areas where I think with that level of money and hopefully gradually improving Sino-Indian relations, um, if, if, China, if China could play a role on the Indo-Pak front um, and, and move that agenda forward, that would probably do more for peace and stability in South Asia than anything else, as well as for their investments. Um, so we have time for one. Yeah, Before, go ahead. To, to yeah. Let me, uh, on the, since you raised the economic issue again and, and raised it as uh, right out to the questions, let me just say a word because we didn't, I didn't get a chance to touch on that as much. This is something that we follow obviously quite a bit, but three words on, uh, three points on, on the broader economic situation. First, is that, again, the, the, the rhetoric and the vision from this government, the unity government on economic issues is, is excellent. I mean, what they laid out in London on the realizing reform uh, and uh, is, is exactly what the international donor community would have wanted to hear. What we need to see is obviously continued prioritization and where they continue to move that forward. Where they have, including when President Ghani was here and uh, what we um, uh, announced at that point was this new development partnership, which actually, I think neatly meets many goals in terms of it's far more aligned. This was an $800 million of pre-appropriated uh, funding, which we aggregated together and will be released on a rolling basis once it meets various benchmarks. Um, the Afghans were quite happy uh, with this because it's more aligned with their interests. Congress is quite happy because of the uh, incentive uh, aspects of it. Uh, it keeps it on a regular basis. And so if we can figure out kind of novel uh, in creative ways uh, to to assist in this manner, we uh, we're looking for them, and and uh, and we certainly welcome that partnership. And this is a real model, I think, of what we can do. The second piece is that, uh, regardless of what happens on investments and a range of other things, it's the the international donor assistance will continue to be extremely important. Um, there will be. Uh, large donor conferences next year, both on the civilian assistance side as a follow-up to Tokyo and London, and also on the security assistance side as uh, defraying the costs of, of ANSF, the billions of dollars that we raise. Um, engaging and keeping the international community engaged, uh, despite all the rest of the competition for international uh, dollars from capitals, will be very important, and therefore all the more reason why uh, this government needs to demonstrate that it is durable and, and, and functional. And then lastly is the fact that though we try to disaggregate many of these issues, the economic, the political, the security, at the end of the day, they're obviously all interwoven and all integrated. And you can hardly begin to talk about economic investment given security situation or frankly given rule of law related issues. And so um, whatever can be done to continue to stabilize uh, the political leadership uh, and show that they're delivering benefits will equally redound on economic issues and security issues. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I think my only point was that it'll be more durable and functional if they get a short term, some discretionary funding to be able to do some things, even over the next six month period to provide jobs. Because that level of unpopularity of the government, I think the, the economic situation is doing more to delegitimize this government than the election process last year. So, but three more quick questions. One over here on the right. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Nazira Azim Karimi. I'm correspondent for Ariana Television Network from Afghanistan. And I'm from Afghanistan as well. Thank you so much. The thing that I'm concerned about is the peace talk process. I am not, unfortunately, very optimistic based off 13 years in the past that it was not you know, positive result. In case, I hope that it's going to be a successful process. Uh, 
in this situation, what will be women's uh, achievement? And number one, you guys believe that women in Afghanistan has achievement during this time, in case if the peace talk process gets successfully done successfully, their achievement, uh, the women achievements, it will not be under question. <coughs> Everything will be okay with the women achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, back here. I'm uh, Mike Carroll, happily retired from the USAID OIG. And so I have a particular interest in corruption and anti-corruption, and Dan, you mentioned it in passing. Uh, the legitimacy of the government, I think, has a lot to do with that. And the unity government talked a lot about it. Now, I've been out of the game for a little while now. But what is exactly happening, both from the USG side and the Afghan side, on anti-corruption? And then we'll end with someone in the middle. Back to the... Uh, thank you. Um, Abdul Manan from uh, Women for Afghan Women. Before I ask my question, uh, allow me to make a humble travel suggestion. The next time uh, you choose to visit India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, I suggest you pay a visit to Kashmir, which happens to be my homeland. Um, uh, it is politically and um, scenically quite unparalleled and significant, so that'd be killing two birds with one stone. Um, but my question is, is regarding the neighbor of Afga Afghanistan to her west. We spoke about the neighbors on the east, which was India and, Af and Pakistan. My question is uh, regarding the role that Iran could play in these peace negotiations, or whether it can play a role, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, fighting ISIS. Uh, which it has will willingly, uh, willingly um, declared that, it, that the Iran Iranians want to do so. Uh, so my question is, uh, where do you think Iran should feature in, these, um, in this process? Um, and uh, Because Iran would like to see a stable Afghanistan as much as any other nation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, start with you, Steve. I'll be, I'll be very quick. Um, uh, last one, I think, to try to put... Iran into these negotiations would blow all the circuits. You know, these are hard <laughs> enough as it is. Uh, though is it is interesting that we heard... Including from, in Washington. <laughs> including, especially in Washington. Though it is interesting that we heard in both India and Afghanistan that economically, uh, if the nuclear agreement goes through and the sanctions come off, um, someone... Uh, you could help me out. Someone suggested there was a large number of Af Afghan workers which would then be able to go into Afghanistan. They would send back remittances, yeah. uh, the, Iran the Indians as well. So th there is an Iran element, but not at the negotiating ta table. Uh, there is optimi you know, it, it's hard to be optimistic, but it's interesting that um, every Afghan we talked to, even the most skeptical, said, test it. Test the Pakistanis, test the Taliban, see if it's real, and I think that's the right thing to do. I'll let Dan deal with the issue but I th about women's achievement, but I think it's been pretty clear in this administration's statements and in, more importantly, President Ghani's statements that his condition for any kind of reconciliation agreement is the recognition and the, of, of the... the um, achievements and progress women have made and that that is not on the negotiating table. That is a non-negotiable demand and that's how it uh, should be. Um, and lastly, I would say, I agree with everything Andrew said about economic assistance, but I'd also agree with the point that Dan made that the political, the economic, and the security are all related. And the truth is, the problem on the economics is not just the absence of reform, it's the absence of confidence. And there's not going to be confidence in the economy if the government doesn't start perform and if, we can't get some, and if they can't get some control over the security situation. Uh, thanks. Um, I'll answer the, the Iran question first as well. It's, uh, it's again, it adds um, a level of conjecture on top of a level of conjecture uh, in terms of the reconciliation plus um, whatever may happen, which is far too premature with the, with the Iran deal, not only what happens in Washington, but most importantly, 
the initial steps that the Iranians have to take in terms of um, what they are proving uh, in terms of uh, meeting their threshold nuclear commitments, what the IAEA uh, validates, uh, and then the beginning of the lifting of just of the nuclear sanctions. So we're many months away from even seeing what happens in that uh, more discrete arena um, and, uh, and, and, and certainly uh, way too speculative in terms of if there's any role uh, for them to play and what that may be uh, around the region. But, um, but there is a potential, obviously, that uh, this is an important neighbor and, uh, and we have uh, participated in multilateral fora with uh, the Iranians on Afghanistan. They're part of the international contact group. They've been part of other multilateral fora. Um, and, uh, and there are many aligned interests on uh, drug issues, on refugee issues, on, on broader stability. So should there come a day when um, we can engage with them uh, more uh, tr openly and transparently um, and, uh, and work together towards uh, common interest and stability, that's certainly one that we would welcome. Um, on anti-corruption initiatives, uh, I think that the, um, I think that this, uh, the unity government uh, has, uh, has done some very important things in its first days uh, from the symbolic uh, uh, acts of the very first few days in terms of reopening uh, the Kabul Bank uh, investigation and uh, trying to continue to uh, find and return funds from that to the enormous investment time that President Ghani and others are taking in procurement reviews and a range of other things to try to limit and constrain uh, corruption. Um, and he talks about it quite openly and transparently as part of his um, uh, it's, it's part of his stump speech in terms of what has to be done within Afghanistan uh, and certainly in terms of appointing the broad range of very meritocratic, technocratic um, uh, ministers and governors. This is something that there is a common interest in. From the U.S. side, you know, we continue uh, to do everything we can to uh, work with our IGs, with CIGAR, with others uh, in terms of the importance of their investigation and demonstrating accountability um, and we'll continue to do so. Do you have a note on that? I'm going to make just a quick note on that. Look, and see if Dan agrees. Afghanistan is going from a fairly corrupt patronage system to a system which will be professional, transparent, and non-corrupt. That is a long, hard road to travel. And if President Ghani moves too fast, he will break his politics and he will cause so many groups to be disgruntled with him and to organize against him. So we have to, we have to be patient and recognize that this kind of tr transition is very difficult. He's got to be on that road. He's got to be convincing with the, Ameri with the, uh, uh, the Afghan people. But we've got to give him a little slack because if he moves too fast and breaks his politics and we lose the government, then we lose the, the possibility of moving to a, a professional, a transparent, and non-corrupt system. And we go back to the old Afghanistan, and that's not good for anybody. Sorry, thank I, you. And I absolutely concur with that. Um, I guess finally, the, the last question on, on reconciliation and the role of women. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that anyone is necessarily optimistic uh, either, but nor are they Pessimistic. I mean, it's truly a matter of just evaluating um, as many, as much information as we can get, and trying to uh, seize most importantly this potential window of opportunity. It's this alignment of factors that's currently there right now, which we want to be able to take advantage of. Should we be able to? So it's the um, continuing to try to build a conducive, um, uh, facilitative. Uh, hospitable environment for a reconciliation process should that become available. Uh, and the way to do that is to continue to work um, with the Afghan government, continue to work with the Pakistanis, continue to work with others in the region, uh, see what is spawned from track one and a half or track two initiatives, um, and, and, and see what might be achieved. But clearly, I mean, the commitment to women is not only something that obviously most unites our political left and right and congressional support in terms of wanting to safeguard the remarkable gains that have been made for women over the course of the last 14 years and which unites most of the key donors. But it's truly something that this government of national unity uh, espouses because it knows it's the right thing 
um, and because it believes as passionately in it as we do. We saw that from President Gandhi's uh, inauguration address when he uh, talked about the role of his wife and when he talked about reconciliation for the first time. Uh, and in all the subsequent times when he's talked about reconciliation and from his actions. The fact that he delivered on a commitment to appoint four women ministers and several women governors at this point. The fact that there's uh, the first uh, woman justice of the Supreme Court that was nominated, uh, who was not uh, confirmed, but that hopefully will take the opportunity to continue to announce women for key positions. And to slowly, again, I mean, cognizant of um, where we started this process, the fact that it's uh, subject to poverty and instability and lack of institutions and lack of capacity, and that every single step here is a calculation between what the policy goals are uh, and the vision and how to get there, but what is politically feasible as well. Um, but, uh, but I have no doubt that that commitment is shared uh, by President Ghani uh, for, to the advancement and, and continuing to safeguard the gains that women have made uh, by President Ghani, by Dr. Abdullah, by this entire uh, government. Um, and it has, uh, uh, with regards specifically to reconciliation, they've said that this is one of their key red lines. And we have said consistently uh, since the beginning of this administration, uh, and I remember uh, Secretary Clinton uh, initially announcing this, the same three red lines uh, for any outcome of a process, uh, particularly the embracing of the Afghan constitution, including its rights for women. Thank you, we're out of time. I'd just like to thank all of you again for coming. I'd like to say thank you to Steve for giving 10 days to visit the region. But last but not least, uh, particular thanks to Ambassador Feldman for his public service, yeah. and in particular for his years at the Special Representative's Office for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and as the SRAP, trying to bring peace to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I have to say, as someone who's been working on the region for a long time, I feel more hopeful now that we're actually inching in that direction than I have in a long time. So thank you all, and thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done.